Young boy in the sixth of Bransworth Castle died last year. He left his estate to his son, who became the seventh Viscount Boyne. Bransworth estate covers a vast area. For those of a statistic mind, this tract of land embraces the parish of Bransworth, Emlington Row, Stockley, Tudo and Willington. Viscount Boyne is reputed to be the third largest landowner in the north. His farms and farmland cover some 15,000 310 acres. These yield an estimated yearly rental of over £74,000. This wealth is boosted by virtue of royalties accrued from mining operations in the area. Messrs. Straker and Love, capitalists and coal owners, have leased over a third of the domain to work it for coal. Recent borings prove that the new quarry to be sunk at Brandon has no magnesium limestone strata. A fairly easy downward passage is envisaged. Coal seams proved are low main with coal one foot, eight inches thick, 57 feet from the surface. The Hutton with coal two feet, eight inches thick, 157 feet from the surface. The Harvey with coal two feet thick, 312 feet from the surface. The Busty with coal four feet thick, 418 feet from the surface. And the Brockwell with coal two feet ten inches thick, 522 feet from the surface. The layer of Sega lies just below the Brockwell seam. This will be used for the manufacture of fire bricks. The shaft will be sunk to a depth of 542 feet four and a half inches to allow for the installation of pumps and to provide a sump in which to collect pit water prior to pumping to the surface. The core partners left the site, no doubt well satisfied but the findings suggest a long and successful partnership. Brandon is situated in the parish of Bransworth between the city of Durham and the Auckland Coal District. The village of Brandon, the birthplace of Treadgold, lies some three miles southwest of Durham. Thomas Treadgold, author of the steam engine, published in 1827 and other works, died in 1834. There are several named places entitled Brandon. There is South Brandon, nearby West Brandon, and East Brandon, the village on the hill. It is primary an agricultural area. East Brandon, the largest of the three, is a self-supporting community living in 25 houses. Brandon Colliery, as this new place is named, is one mile away on lower ground and will thus form a separate community. Sinkers are in demand as new pits are planned in various parts of the county. The sinker's gear is set. They begin their downward drive, boring for coal. Their goal, the first seam of workable coal, the Hutton seam, which is called two feet, eight inches thick, waiting to be worked. Joe Stanger, a master sinker imported from Northumberland, is in charge of 12 men, most of whom had learned the art of sinking from their fathers. They work in three shifts, which ensures continuous sinking. Joe wears a commodious leather hat with a long peak at the back. A large waterproof smock-like coat is strapped across his chest. These afford protection from the wet sides of the shaft as he descends. He wears clogs, these being light and hard-wearing. Shaft sinking is one of the most hazardous of jobs as the sinkers line the shaft with steel sheets. Until recently, timber was used to shore the sides of the shaft. The lining or tubbing for the shaft is calculated to cost between £60 and £70 for each fathom sunk. The sinkers take pride in their highly skilled work. Joe Stanger's men earn seven shillings per fathom for the first five fathoms sunk, 14 shillings for the second five fathoms, 21 shillings for the third five fathoms, and so on. Seven shillings extra for each successive five fathoms. Into 1857. Sinkers, as anxious as their masters, bore steadily downward. Buildings mushroom nearby. Blacksmiths, masons, joiners, all are busy. Cartmen lead stone and timber to the new site. Houses are built. The first row is one room down, one room up. The sinkers and their families are housed first. These buildings are said to have cost the colliery owners around £50 each to build. Builders are not obliged to provide drains and sanitation, but they are erecting netties across the street away from the houses. These netties are huddled in clusters of four, one netty for each household. These are brick built with a tin roof sloping to the rear. Each has a sliding cast iron plate set in front, which when lifted facilitates emptying. Richard is a 59 year old cartman born at nearby Sunland Bridge, 
with other cartmen, lead stone quarried at the top of the hill, just approaching East Brandon. Levy cart horses holding back swaying loads as they travel the incline down to the new colliery. The thick walls of the first houses to be built encase a floor made up of square quarles. Until quite recently, colliery houses had floors made from a mixture of lime, small coal and gravel. The fire range is large. There is an iron boiler at one side of the fireplace, a round oven is set at the other side. The boiler is filled with water collected from a spring in the farmer's field. Hinged wooden shutters are fitted over the downstairs windows, these being fastened back to the outside wall during the day. At night they are closed and secured from the inside. Among the first settlers are George Madden and his wife Mary. George is a joiner. They took their new son to be christened George in the, in the parish church of St. Brandon in the picturesque village of Bransmouth. The Reverend A. Duncombe Shafto also baptised Jane Ann Snaith. The village has a new national school, which at two miles distance is the nearest school for the Collier's children. The new railway line running from Durham to Bishop Auckland after four years of labour and tragedy was opened on April the 1st. Colliery workers, together with their wives and children, gathered on this important day, alongside the new railway track at Brandon. A train carrying the officials of the North Eastern Railway Company is due to leave Durham at 2pm. It will travel through Relly, Langley, Brandon, Bransworth, Willington and on to Bishop Auckland. Forgotten for the moment were the eight men and boys killed and the numerous injured during the laying of the two and a half mile stretch of line from Durham to Brandon Colliery. Women nervously clutch their shawls. Men puff on, mas puff on masham pipes. Snow boxes click. Children, without success, try to control excited dogs. April the 1st, April Fool Day, a day to be remembered as the opening day of the Bishop Auckland Branch Railway. For most onlookers, this was their first view of a moving train. Here it comes. Margaret Hall, nine years of age, Will Knighton, junior, seven, Isabella Parkinson, eleven, John Bell and John Coxon, both ten, and Mary Garbett, six, with her four-year-old sister, Margaret, shout in chorus as the labouring train crossed the small bridge spanning the road running to Durham. Faces to, turned towards Langley. On time, ten minutes past two, the train noisily approaches Brandon Colliery. Livestock in nearby fields scatter in terror as the engineer, wind blown, operates, operates the engine whistle. Smiling, top hatted men wave from carriage windows. The greetings are returned by the excited group lining the track. On its immediate return from Bishop Auckland, a public luncheon to celebrate the event is to be held in the new town hall, Durham. Tickets are ten shillings and sixpence each. Huge balks have been erected near the shaft. These will support the heapstead. The new engine house contains machinery for winding the cage in the shaft. Modern pitch uses steel rope to draw the cage. Last year, 136 pitmen were killed in pit accidents in the northern district, a number of them due to pit shaft mishaps. Greater safety measures have been sought. Coal owners and others, perturbed over loss of life in pit shaft accidents, welcomed, welcomed experiments which took place in December 1848 when parachutes were attached to a pit cage which stopped the descent of a cage if the shaft rope broke. Again in 1850 when Ford Rainier's patent safety apparatus was given a trial. The idea being that if the cage rope snapped in the shaft, two arms would be released which would automatically bite into the sides of the shaft. Wooden tubes, a recent innovation, each built to hold eight and a half hundred weight of coal, are arranged in convenient heaps for dispatch below as required. Each four-wheeled tub is strongly built, having two iron bands bolted around its body for added strength. A most important feature is the boiler house, which produces steam to operate the winding gear. The railway station, the title is a misnomer, as it is only a small building, is in use. It has been open two weeks. The parliamentary rate for train fares being one penny per mile. The colliery folk will no doubt use this swift and exciting mode of travel. Thomas Carter arranged to have his infant son christened George on the Saturday as the trains do not stop at Brandon Colliery during the week. The baby being carried the quarter of a mile from Bransworth Station to St Brandon's. Farmland contracts as more houses are built to provide shelter for the expected surge of pitmen. More land is buried under spoil brought out of the shaft. 
Richard, Richard Isop lives at number 8 East Street. Besides leading stone from the quarry, performs other tasks. He cleans refuse from the netties, which he dumps in a field lying north of the colliery. There being as yet no shops of Brandon Colliery, people travel to the market at Durham every Saturday. Potatoes currently costing one shilling a peck, eggs at twelve a shilling. Beef, seven pence half penny a pound, veal is eight pence a pound. Chickens cost one shilling and four pence each. Coffee at one shilling and two pence a pound is more popular than tea, which is selling at three to four shillings a pound. Candles for use in the home and in the pit cost eleven pence half penny a pound. Whiskey is two shillings and six pence a bottle. Guinness Dublin Stout is a good buy at six shillings for a dozen quart bottles. During August, a new winning was started at Brandon Colliery from the surface down to the Hutton Seam. A boring was also continued below to the Bransmouth or Brockwell Seam by Mr Forster. The owners, with great foresight, have elected to operate two shafts, one on each side of the railway track and some hundreds of yards apart. In due course, when a link is forged underground, ventilation, transport and safety will be greatly enhanced. Will Dickinson, an able 26-year-old pitman, surveyed newly built Durham Street, the first long colliery row. Will was born in Jarrow and currently works at Bransmouth Colliery, about two and a half miles up the line, another colliery owned by Messrs. Straker and Love. He had left his 25-year-old wife Elizabeth and his daughters Marianne and Margaret four years and one year at Bransmouth Colliery. Mr Forster had engaged him to work as a sinker with him at Brandon Colliery. Will met William Garbutt, 28 years of age, set on as joiner's labourer at 17 shillings a week. He came from Yorkshire. His 24-year-old wife Sarah, their two young daughters Mary and Margaret and three-year-old John Henry all occupy number 14 Durham Street. Families are migrating from outside the northeast into the colliery areas. There is a drift from the land. Agricultural wages are poor, ranging from 9 shillings to 12 shillings a week. Men from Cornwall, Lancashire, Yorkshire, Staffordshire and Derbyshire are moving into the new collieries. Scots and Irish are among the migrants. One historian suggests that Brandon derives its name from the Scottish and Irish abbot and confessor, St. Brandon. He was abbot of Clonfort in Ireland. Legend says that he flew through the air in his chariot. Another interpretation is that Brandon is from the Anglo-Saxon Brun, that is brown, and Dun meaning a hill. A third definition is Brown's Den, from which a fierce beast is said to have roamed, causing great havoc and consternation among the inhabitants. Brown's Path, now Bransmouth, where the beast trod. The Viscount and Lady Boyne returned to their castle at Bransmouth. They with honour J.F. Amitil Russell have spent the summer at their family residence at Stackholm in Ireland. A large horse-drawn carriage conveyed them the 400 yards or so to the castle. The railway company built a small station at Bransmouth, here the train stopped daily. The day following the return of Viscount Boyne saw a gig leave Brandon Colliery on its sorrowful journey to Bransmouth. It carried the remains of baby Samuel, Samuel Routledge, the four-month-old son of Robert Routledge of number 15 South Street. During the year, the Reverend Shafto baptised three babies born at Brandon Colliery. Glossary, netty, cavity to hold household lashes, rubbish and excrement. Qualls, bricks eight inches square and three inches thick. Borks, squared timber. Heapstead, structure built with borks round the shaft. Peck, 20 pounds in weight. Gig, a light two-wheeled carriage. Into 1858, 